fish is not the only introduced tropical fish species in Florida waters. There's a whole range of Indo-Pacific species that are found there. And there was a very clever study that was done a few years ago trying to pinpoint the source of introduction of all these different species. They looked, for example, at ballast water from ships as a possible source. But there was really no correlation between the frequency of reports or the frequency of new species reported and the amount of shipping activity that was going on around Florida. So it really doesn't seem like these exotic species have arrived there through shipping. It's much more likely that they've arrived there through the aquarium trade in some form. And to be honest, once you realize that lionfish are so predatory, it's easy to understand why people would want to get rid of them. It's a popular fish in the aquarium trade because it is a very beautiful fish. But whereas very small juveniles, perhaps they don't cause so much damage. As soon as they grow a little bit, they probably get to a size where they can eat virtually anything in a saltwater aquarium. And their owners may well have thought they were being humane by releasing them. It's really a, it's a matter of educating people who want to keep animals like that as to you know the potential consequences of releasing these animals in in habitats where they've never been before so so education i think could have played a very big part in trying to prevent this thing from happening The lionfish is the first non-native marine species that we've had to deal with here. So I think by getting the word out that, hey, you know what, this could be a bad thing. These could eat juvenile groupers. These could sting you. These are some potentially um, economically and ecologically harmful creatures. It might make people think twice about dumping their aquarium fish into the ocean, for example. I have a lot of compassion for aquarium owners who have fish that get too big and perhaps some of those people, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm not saying that they're responsible for this problem or for non-native marine fishes in general, but some people are probably dumping their aquarium fishes into the ocean. And I have heard rumors uh, left, right, and the other way about how the slime fish got introduced. There are rumors that dive operators have been planting them to attract divers for their operations. There are rumors that aquarium store owners have been seeding reefs so they can collect fish off of them versus having them shipped in. I mean, there are rumors out the wazoo on this. <laughs> Whenever something this horrible happens, everyone's pointing the finger down the line at the next person. No one has seen anyone dump a fish into the ocean, so we cannot say um, for certain how it got there. However, on the one hand, we have a really good idea that it's somehow via the aquarium industry. We know the lionfish probably didn't come over in ballast water. It probably didn't come over as a fisheries, you know, live food. It probably came through the aquarium industry. That's as good as I think we're going to get. I, I really do. So perhaps this proliferation of lionfish and the media that it has garnered you know, it's a terrible situation, but if it can bring awareness to the issue and perhaps curtail the activities that tend to bring about those sorts of actions that release non-native pets into the wild, then maybe there is a bright side to the issue. I really do have a lot of compassion for individual folks who have an aquarium fish that gets too big and they think to themselves, oh, this poor fish, I've had it for so long, it's my pet, they identify with it, they don't want to kill it, so they think, I'll just release it into the ocean and it can live out its days happily there in the ocean. And I think a lot of times it's just a matter of education. Those folks, they really do believe they're doing the right thing. And if there was only one person that did that, <laughs> the impact might not be so terrible, but it's never just one person.
Okay, so the Ground Zero story in Hurricane Andrew is very popular and it's been spread through a lot of the media. Um, and it probably should have been because it was published, the account was published in an American Fishery Society newsletter in 1995. And so it was the first published account of lionfish being reported from the Western Atlantic. There is, or there are reports that go back even prior to that, however. Uh, a fish was collected by a fisherman in Miami in 1985 and brought in to the National Marine Fisheries Service lab in Miami way back then. And nobody could believe that there was a lionfish, but it was the first one, the only one, and there was a big time lag before any, any other reports had come in. The Hurricane Andrew report is kind of second or third hand information and uh, nobody has been able to track it back down to find out exactly where the house was, where the aquarium was, how many fish were released, etc. So um, it's popular in the literature, but we're not 100% sure that that ever took place. However, after that, there are certainly more, more documented cases of lionfish in South Florida in the mid 1990s and late 1990s, increasingly into the, to the late 1990s. I, I'm a little bit skeptical about the Hurricane Andrew story just because it was three years later in a newsletter and there's no real evidence of that. It's just secondhand reports. Yeah, well, the genetics work that was done by uh, Wilson Freshwater and others, and we helped with that paper that uh, came out this year, traces the genetics of fish in the Bahamas and along the east coast of the U.S. back to nine founding female fish and there had to be at least one male in there somewhere to have effective reproduction, but uh, basically a very narrow genetic bottleneck of a very few fish that started this all off. So even if the Hurricane Andrew report were true, uh, that report was five or six fish. And we know based on the genetics that it was more than that, but certainly not a large number.